You've heard this objection before. You proclaim the Bible is God's inspired, infallible, inerrant, sufficient Word of God. And the student responds because they probably watched a 30-second YouTube video. Everyone knows you can't learn anything from a 30-second YouTube video. Videos have to be at least seven minutes long, like Todd's, to contain any truth. Hey, the Bible, it's like the game of telephone kind of not really this is gonna take at least seven minutes welcome to apologia where a former christian takes a look at the claims of christians well i've talked about animated and controversial christian radio host todd friel on other channels I think this is the first time I've done so here. Visit just about any university campus, attempt to share your faith, and you're inevitably going to be slammed by the telephone game. That is why we have produced Road Trip to Truth 13 episodes to deal with the objections that perhaps your kids and your grandkids have about the Christian Bible. Okay, so we'll cover a video that someone else made for Todd Friel. Have you ever given your name to the barista, maybe even spelled it for them, and then gotten a cup with a name that's totally unrecognizable? Sometimes it's really, really bad. I've been Jan, Janet, even Brody. Today, I'm Jun. Most people know that as the telephone game. I suppose so. This seems more of a dictation error, where the telephone game is more about oral traditions, word of mouth being passed along. Since the distinction between oral and written transmission is central to this video, and also your massively incorrect conclusions, this is a bumpy start. Also, your name is John, one of the most popular names in North America for centuries. I don't actually believe this problematic Jun story. I think you are comfortable fabricating a detail of a story and passing it along as true because it's for dramatic effect to convince me about Jesus. This will come up later. A common objection to the reliability of the Bible is that it's been around the block. If I said to you that the Bible was passed along like a telephone game, what would you say? I'd say, buckle up, John, because a main reason to do man-on-the-street interviews is to demonstrate the general public's lack of awareness about a particular topic. But today you've asked Polygia, and I've thought about this one a lot. That seems... About right. Do you think the Bible's changed over time? Um, undeniably. The man in the flare hat is correct. Open up your own Bible and check the footnotes on the end of Mark chapter 16 or John chapters 7 and 8. They will probably admit that the early manuscripts don't have these sections. Or in other words, these parts of the Bible have been changed. This basic premise is undeniable. We really don't know if the events in the Bible are truly accurate as they are depicted. Like, we don't know if that truly happened. Put another star on his shirt, because this is really the actual important question. Not if the Bible has changed, but did the events described in the Bible really happen? But I don't know who compiled those books together. I don't know who changed them, who translated them. It was translated from one language to another. And because of this process, some people think that the meaning that the original authors had doesn't come through anymore because of all the translations. Maybe you believe that. I don't, because I understand that modern Bible translations go directly from the original Bible manuscript language, be it Greek, Hebrew, or a splash of Aramaic, directly to the target language, presumably English for anyone watching Todd's video. If anyone imagines that the Bible was translated from Greek to Latin, then from Latin to German, then from German to Spanish, and then finally Spanish to English, that's false and a simple correctable misconception about a process. It seems like that's the scenario John is responding to, but it's also possible he simply meant the potential loss of nuance and meaning when translating any one language to any other language. 
or even one cultural context to another. This is one reason that Christian academics tend to go back to the original Hebrew or Greek when debating biblical interpretation. It does eliminate translation as a source of error, but unfortunately there is no way to overcome cultural change or the need to interpret writing. I mean, I had to address two different ways to interpret John's meaning in these few sentences, and we live in the same time and culture. The meaning of the original is always interpretive. I think it's a fair observation to note that the so-called inerrant word of God is subject to the same level of ambiguity and misinterpretation as every other mere human communication. It seems an all-powerful being could have come up with something better for his most important message. The game of telephone, that game that kids play where one kid whispers something into the next kid's ear and by the time you get all the way down 20 kids or so, the message has completely changed. So like a lot of people when they look at the Bible they think about it like that. That argument might apply to something like oral tradition. That's exactly correct. When I make a telephone game-like objection to the modern story of Christianity, I'm not talking about the period after it was written down. I'm talking about the 30 to 40 years between when Jesus died and when the first gospel was written down. That was three plus decades of oral tradition. In that time, the stories of Jesus were being passed around orally. And just like the whispered sentence of the game is corrupted after just a few repetitions, we have no reason to think that the first people telling stories of Jesus would be immune to the universal human conditions of imperfect understanding, imperfect memory, and imperfect communication. But the telephone game analogy actually doesn't go far enough in one important area. Remember at the start of this video? When John walked through the door with the mislabeled cup and he told us that today he was called Jun? Today, I'm Jun. Do we honestly believe that John went to a coffee shop moments before the video shoot and just happened to be handed an otherwise generic, free of copyright design elements cup with J-U-N-N -N written in very large, incredibly clear lettering? Or do we assume that this is a prop? And the details of the story, with a possibly true, possibly not core, were altered in this particular telling in order to illustrate the point John was trying to make. And it's okay for John to violate the commandment against the bearing of false witness in this way, because it's for dramatic purposes, and ultimately to bring people to a saving grace in Jesus. If John is being loose with the facts and hyperbolic in his enthusiasm in order to service his love for God, why wouldn't we assume that the 40 years of early Christian storytelling suffer the same, and for those exaggerations to have accumulated? After all, these were people attempting to convert their neighbors and save them from hell. The period where Christianity was a purely oral tradition was not only a period of telephone game, it was a telephone game that was highly incentivized to embellish in order to avoid eternal punishment for the next person in line. But this is why it's so wonderful that God gave us a written standard, because a written standard doesn't change over time, and you can go back through things like textual criticism and archaeology, and you can actually look and compare the written standard that we have today with the written copies of Scripture from centuries ago. This is all generally correct. In the extent manuscripts, there are tens or hundreds of thousands of variations ranging from the common spelling differences to accidental insertions and deletions to insertions and deletions that seem quite deliberate. Including the early centuries right after the time of the apostles. While correct, that's potentially misleading. As he seems to admit, we have nothing from the first centuries when the apostles lived. From the second century, just a few credit card sized fragments and not really much even in the 3rd century, already 200 years after the death of Jesus. Note that it's not until the 11th century, a thousand years after, when we start to have a lot of documents to compare. So, early centuries right after the time of the apostles? is brushing over a lot of years. So this idea that it's changed over time is simply inaccurate. If it was a purely oral tradition, maybe that argument could be made. I make that argument precisely because Christianity started out as purely an oral tradition. This is undeniable. We have no way to know how the stories changed and were embellished before they were written down. This was the start of legend development. 
It doesn't matter if written copies remain consistent if what was written down in the first place was the result of decades of growing tall tales. But a written word, we can actually go back and check, and it demonstrates that the game of telephone, that analogy, it doesn't apply to the scriptures. Correct. Despite all the scribal errors, accidental changes, and deliberate changes, a few we know about, but likely others we do not, the telephone analogy doesn't apply well to the written scriptures. Can I tell you how annoying that is to me when I first heard Dr. Nathan Boosnitz respond to the telephone game objection? I was like, duh, why didn't I think of that? This is so obvious. Yes, so obvious that even me, an amateur Bible critic, would have been happy to point it out to you, Todd. The trouble is that by correctly pointing out that the telephone game is disanalogous to the written period, it is entirely apt to the oral tradition period. This sleight of hand gives the appearance of answering the objection, but it very much does not. I would simply ask one side of the auditorium to tell the person next to them what is written on this piece of paper. In other words, to communicate an oral tradition. All right. Well, Todd is going to use a good chunk of his seven minutes re-explaining the difference between verbal messages and written messages. Then on the right side, I would encourage people to write down what that piece of paper said. I trust everyone's already got this figured out and we can skip ahead. On our left side, the oral tradition, it would probably be something like, for God created a world that Noah's Ark had two giraffes and six lobsters on it. It wouldn't even be close. Why? Because it's an oral tradition. That's right. And for the decades before the first gospel, the stories about Jesus wouldn't even be close. Why? Because it's an oral tradition. Why didn't I think about that? That's so obvious. Right? I felt the same way when I started to think about it. The first stories of Christianities were spread word of mouth by people desperately wanting to convince others that Christianity is true. The next time somebody says to you, hey, the Bible's like the game of telephone, you say, no, 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 no. That's an oral transmission. We have a written transmission and it is therefore reliable. Only as reliable as the oral tradition that it recorded. The objection stands, even if some skeptics could be more precise about their wording. It's the stories in the Bible that are victims of the telephone game, not the Bible itself. Now, since Todd is simply pretending the valid argument doesn't exist, he's also ignoring the common objection from Christians who acknowledge the problem, or at least the objection that I would have made when I was a Christian, that first century Jews lived in an oral culture. So, therefore, everything they passed along about Jesus would have been accurate. Sadly, this isn't a notion that holds up to scrutiny. For the past hundred years or so, starting prominently with New Testament scholar Rudolf Bultmann, whom we spoke about in my last video, this notion has been picked apart from all angles, and joined with hundreds of papers of modern science on memory in general, and memory within the context of different world cultures. The details are beyond the scope of this video, in fact, the evidence against such notion filled an entire book from Dr. Bart Ehrman called Jesus Before the Gospels. In his blog, the professor teased the topic this way. The first part of the chapter deals with a very common misconception about oral traditions in oral cultures. A misconception I hear all the time from lots of people, including my students who get upset when I discuss how traditions about Jesus appear to have been altered in the process of retelling in the years before the Gospels were written. The misconception is that in oral cultures, people had better memories than those of us who live in written cultures, and that they went out of their way to make sure that they preserved their cherished traditions, including their sacred traditions, with great accuracy, since there was no other way to preserve them in a world without writing. You may well have heard that yourself. You may well have believed it. It's widely believed. But it appears to be wrong. My hunch is that this is one of those modern myths that everyone hears and believes because it makes so much sense, and then passes it on to others who believe it because everyone else says so. But it does appear to be a modern myth. There are several points to make. The first seems fairly obvious when you think about it, but most of us have never actually much thought about it. It is this. 
there is no inherent difference between the brains of someone in an oral culture and someone in a written culture. Pointing to rigorous memorization of the Hebrew Torah only serves to emphasize the primary distinction our video addresses, the ability to preserve what has been written, the Old Testament scriptures, and the ability to preserve what is still fluid. Indeed, the data suggests that the entire notion of precise repeatable preservation being a virtue comes from written cultures and is foreign, strange, and counter to the values of oral cultures that have been studied. The New Testament itself is replete with stories of lies, miscommunication, and warnings against heretical twists spreading around. None of this is consistent with the oral culture preservation myth. If you're interested, perhaps I can do a longer video on this topic one day. But this oral culture notion is not one that should be accepted at face value. Ask for the evidence, not just intuition and conjecture. And yet, the objections don't stop there. No sir, Rebob, there's lots of YouTube videos meant to debunk the Bible. YouTube videos, man. You can't trust them, says Todd Friel on his YouTube video. That particular objection too is simply debunked, courtesy of Road Trip to Truth, available at wretched.org slash road trip. What do you think, everyone? Should I buy Todd's $30 video to see what else he's debunked? It would be educational, but also mean giving him money. Either way, you don't have to wait to see me take a look at more claims of Christians. Just tap on the thumbnail on screen now, and I'll see you over there. Later.